I hit a jackpot on a slot machine on like a one or two dollar bet where I won close to ten thousand dollars. And that for me was this really pivotal experience, right? Where I saw, oh man, I could win 5,000 times my money. Maybe I could, you know, set myself up. Hey everybody, welcome back to the One Day at a Time podcast. Today I have a guest named Sam and we're going to be talking about his experience with gambling harm and what he does right now to try to fight against it. Sam, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rob. For those that don't know you, what is it that you do in the space uh, and how did you get to this point? Yeah, um, so professionally, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Evive. We make a digital health platform designed to combat gambling harm. So it's really designed for anyone who gambles to prevent, reduce, or aid in the recovery from, you know, any harm they've experienced through gambling. And what made you want to make an app like this? I mean, a lot of times we see people make apps because they're super profitable or because they think the tech is like so super revolutionary. Like what what motivated you to start something to try to help problem gamblers? So I've always loved tech, but this space in particular is because I myself am in recovery from a gambling addiction. You know, I've been in recovery now for about four or five years. Uh, I'm 37. So it took me, man, probably more than a decade in active addiction to really understand what was happening and to really get the help and the resources that I needed. And having that firsthand experience and how challenging it was and how isolating it was and how much it really both affected my life so profoundly and was also totally silent, right? And unrecognized by my family and my friends and my coworkers. It really made me want to do something to give back to the community. I think that's awesome because something that I always say is we should try to help the person that we used to be. And that's exactly what you're doing with this technology. But before we dive kind of deeper into that tech, why don't we go back a little bit and kind of set the stage here? Do you remember the first time that you gambled? Ooh, yeah. I have a couple early memories. Like games were always a huge thing in my family, right? Card games, starting with Go Fish through Gin Rummy to sitting down with my mom when I was like 10 playing blackjack with my, you know, grandpa's old casino chips and, you know, her giving me a dollar if I was able to turn 20 chips into a hundred. But the first time that I really got into gambling was through poker. I was probably 12 years old when Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker on ESPN. And that to me was just a, a huge, huge deal. It it gave me this pathway into masculinity where I could compete with my friends who I saw as cooler and more athletic and bigger, you know, than, than I was um, on this kind of even playing field of the card table, which was a place that I was really comfortable. So would you say that, you know, gambling from a very early point was a part of your identity once you started doing it and it was kind of helping you find meaning? Yeah, I think that, you know, middle school, early high school, I think everyone is really looking for, you know, who am I? Where do I fit in? What is my group? And gambling for me really gave me that that pathway. You know, it it allowed me to engage and interact with people that I wouldn't necessarily, you know, do in, in normal social situations. It gave me this kind of access to prestige or, or power because if you had money, right? Especially in high school, and you could do things like go out to eat, right? It it gave you this certain kind of social status. Yeah, I, I think it was a huge part of my identity and became a, a bigger part of my identity when I went to college. You know, I, I went from a very small school where everybody knew me and I knew everybody to this huge public university. And I really had to try to find my 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 social group, right? And And poker in the dorms was one of the first things that I did that was just immediate, right? I, I could go in and meet other people. I can relate to that so much because when I went to college, I was gambling so much at the time that essentially it was all I thought about. And I didn't even try to make friends with other people, but I can remember a day in one of my classes where I was gambling on my computer, someone behind me like had seen it. So then that struck up a conversation and it was almost like 
a social symbol to say you were a gambler. And I think that's growing right now, especially among college aged kids. But would you say that, um, you know, your friends and your community in college viewed gambling in a positive light when you guys were doing it? It certainly wasn't viewed in a negative light, right? I, I think it was something that was condoned by the administration. Like we were playing for 20 or 40 bucks in, in the common room of the dorms, right? I think when we, when we turned 18 and we were able to um, go to local tribal casinos, that's when things, I started to think a little bit more about, you know, the moral side, like, is this good? Is this bad? Is this a place that I want to be? But in the beginning, yeah, it was seen as totally positive. Let's explore those first experiences at the casinos. So up until this point, you've been doing home games, you've been gambling with family and friends. What was it like the first time you walked into a real casino? It was it was a little overwhelming walking into a casino for the first time. You know, I had been maybe a couple times before college, right? Like as a kid with family and the bright lights and the noise, you know, pretty overstimulating. But I started gambling in Central California at a, a tribal casino called Chumash. And the poker room was in the back. And you had to walk through the casino floor to get there. Um, and I just remember being just overwhelmed with like the slot machines and the table games and all the people bustling about. But I was also really snobby <laughs> at that point. I saw poker as a game of skill, right? And I saw the people sitting down at the slot machines as suckers, right? Like I, I would never be caught dead sitting in front of a slot machine at that point in time. I think this is pretty common, like structural design of casinos. It's like you have to walk through all of the things that have the highest return on investment for them in order to get to the things that still have a return on investment for them. But, you know, the poker rooms, the the restaurants, the things that are you know, not necessarily where the, the main source of revenue is coming from. I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. Do you remember the first time you switched from poker to playing a casino game? So I used to carpool with my friends to play poker. And there were three of us that went all the time, you know, a few times a week. And the casino was probably an hour away. Um, so if I lost money early or one of us lost money early, we had to sit around and wait for the other guys to be done. And sometimes that would be like five or six hours. So the first time that I distinctly remember playing a different game was I had lost all of my money playing poker. I had gone back to the ATM and I had overdrawn my, you know, basically maxed out my ATM account. And I was down to my last, you know, hundred dollars. And I was like, okay, it's not working for me at the poker table. Let me go try something different. And I sat down at a penny slot machine and I bet like 50 cents. And I just kept clicking the button and clicking the button. And, you know, it wasn't a huge pivotal experience for me. Honestly, I, I thought that it was kind of boring at first. I really walked away thinking, I don't understand how people can sit here for hours and hours. Did there ever come a point where you did sit there for hours and hours playing slots? <laughs> yeah, part of the reason I'm laughing is that I, I developed a real serious addiction to, to slot machines, sports betting and table games and all of the other things. I think at that point in my gambling experience, my, my gambling career, I was really focused on the game. Like I was really in love with poker and the strategy of it, picking off someone's bluff or understanding when, you know, I made the right move myself. And I wasn't so concerned with the money because my tuition was paid for. And if I lost money, it meant that I didn't have, you know, fun money for a couple weeks. But even if I lost the, you know, $200 I was going with that week, it didn't really affect me financially. As time went on with my gambling and I, experienced greater losses and the financial component became a bigger part of it. And I felt angrier about having lost and I was chasing to get back. Then it was way less about the love of the game or the strategy or the people. And it was way more about just winning, right? And, and beating the casino. And that's where I feel like I really started to experience problems. Admittedly, you went from a game where you had a better chance of winning to a game where you had no chance of winning. And the intention of making that shift was because you wanted to make money. 
did that happen as a result of some kind of early win on one of these slot machines or games? Or was this just like a, a trance-like state that you were finding yourself in? A little bit of both. You know, I've read a fair amount that a lot of people that develop, you know, gambling addictions like me do have an early win. And I had some early wins on the poker table. But, you know, when you win at poker, if you start with $100 and you leave with three or $400, that's a really good night, right? Like three or four times your money. Maybe five years down the line from this point when I was in my early 20s and I was working in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I was totally alone and isolated and by myself and feeling lonely, you know, away from my friends and my support network, I started getting into other forms of gambling and gambling online. And I hit a jackpot on a slot machine on like a $1 or $2 bet where I won close to $10,000. And that for me was this really pivotal experience, right? Where I saw, oh man, I could win 5,000 times my money, right? Instead of just three or four times my money. If I could do that with a big enough bet, maybe I could, you know set myself up that's such a distorting factor when you have this idea in your head that like you can always 5000 x your money i imagine that leads to a lot of thoughts of well, i mean i imagine i know <laughs> that it leads to a lot of thoughts of like hey like i can always get out of this um were there times along this experience that you were like against the wall financially yeah you know what's really interesting for me is that i've always been good with money um, like I've had a budget that I've tracked myself on since I was, you know, like 10 years old. So when I was working early in my career and I was single and I had no responsibilities like, you know, the two kids and the wife that I have now, um, essentially I could put as much of my extra money to gambling as I wanted to every given month. When I started and I was, you know, making my first salary in tech, that might have been a hundred bucks at the end of the month, right? And I would try to make that a hundred dollars last. Well, three or four years into my career, that was a few thousand dollars a month. I never felt myself strapped in terms of, man, I racked up, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in debt or something. But I found myself financially strapped in that I was outside of my rent and my basic food, right? I spent every single penny I made. I lost that gambling. And it got to a point where I would say, okay, you know, I get paid on Friday. I'll have $2,000. And all I have to do is make that money last for the next two weeks until I get paid again. And I'm going to go to the poker room and I'm not going to sit down at the slot machines. I'm not going to sports bet it. And I'm going to walk in and I'm going to play $1, $2 poker, right? I'm going to play for three hours. And Friday would come and I would get that paycheck and I'd get to the casino. And before I even got to the poker room, it was like I would be drawn to a slot machine and I would lose the entire $2,000. And it was only after I lost it that I could kind of like, okay, I can't gamble. I can't think about gambling. I have the next two weeks that I can just try to focus on, on other things. You're kind of staying in the same place if you're spending all of your disposable income on gambling because you're not building up that net worth. You're not building up any kind of nest egg. I, I can imagine the feeling for a lot of people is that they they feel like gambling is the only way out. It's the only way to make up for it when in reality it's what's actually keeping you at that point. What was so interesting to me about just going back to the question about the jackpot. What was so interesting to me about winning the $10,000, which unsurprisingly to you and probably anyone that's experienced a gambling addiction, I lost within the course of probably a month, right? Every penny of it. Two things that I, I find interesting reflecting on it. One is I didn't tell anybody that I won it on a slot machine. I told people that I won it playing poker because I saw poker as a respectable chance, to, like test of skill that I could proudly say, but I was way too embarrassed to tell anyone that I won it on a slot machine. And the second piece is that it totally skewed my perception of bet sizing, right? So before that time, I, I was staking one or two dollars on a spin, right? If I sat down at a slot machine at that time, maybe I'd start with 30 bucks. 
But with ten thousand dollars in in my bankroll, I, I remember it was the World Cup of I don't know whatever that was, twenty fourteen maybe. All of a sudden, I went from placing ten dollar bets on sports games and enjoying them to putting like five hundred or six hundred or a thousand dollars on a soccer game, and it felt weaker, right? It was a less intense experience. It totally ruined my perception of of money. Wow. I, I went through a similar experience, I believe, where it was just like a progressive problem. It, it just the bet sizes had to increase, the frequency had to increase. You know, at this point you're saying that you're going in, you're experiencing these losses, you're kind of waiting like two weeks to give it another try. When did the frequency really hit its peak? When were you gambling the most, we'll say? I was probably gambling the most between 25 and 30. I would say I had gotten to the point where essentially all I wanted to do was gamble. I wanted to be in action all the time. I, you know, would wake up in the morning and I would start betting on whatever the first sport was, right? I was on the West Coast, so baseball or, or soccer, and I would continue that through the rest of the day. And then as I would win or lose my sports bets, I would, in the middle of the day, try to make that money back right? Or try to like amplify the money that I had won by playing blackjack or roulette or slot machines. And because it was on my phone and I could do it all the time, it started to creep into work, you know, like I would sneak off to the bathroom at my job and like spin the slot machine 10 times. Or I would be on a date with a, a girl, you know, and I would be looking at sports scores or like spinning roulettes, you know, in my phone under the table, which is crazy to think about in in retrospect. But it was the last thing I did before I went to sleep. And it was the very first thing I did when I woke up. And I distinctly remember the feeling every morning of waking up with this immediate shot of adrenaline, of just like my eyes would open, shot of adrenaline, either what happened yesterday how much did I lose and how much am I going to work for free right, to try to make that money back? Or how much did I win and now how was I going to invest that money you know, for, for the rest of the week? That was it, right? I, I probably lived like that for five years. Would you say that there was any point during that time where you were at an amount that you felt like it was sufficient or enough? Did you feel like there was ever going to be a satisfaction to it? No, because if I lost, I felt stupid and like I had been tricked and I had to win the money back. And if I won, I felt like, oh, this is so easy. Like it's just free money. I should keep winning. And as my logic really left the the conversation like a, okay, a long time before that, I got to a point financially in my career where the amount that I would have had to win to actually change my lifestyle, right, to allow me to like buy a house or a car or something was really high. And with the stakes that I was gambling, there's just no way mathematically that I was ever going to win something at that level. And the losses just kept pace with how much money I had coming in the door. I worked probably from age 23 to age 30 and in that time, you know, I probably took home, I don't know, half a million dollars in terms of like salary and bonuses outside of my, you know, day-to-day -day living expenses. And when I quit gambling, right, I had $10,000 in the bank, maybe. I, 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 had, I had nothing, right? I had no investments. I had no property. I had no money. And I think the worst part of it was that I didn't do the things that I think are really worthwhile to do in your 20s. I didn't take crazy trips. I didn't take, you know, three months off of work and go have a sabbatical. I just worked 80 hours a week and then lit that money on fire, you know, in the in, in my free time. It's like death by a thousand cuts instead of by one blow. And that's what I appreciate about you sharing this story is like a lot of people have this perception of gambling and problem gambling of like uncut gems or owning Mahoney, where these big, horrible things happen all at once. 
But realistically, with online gambling, you could be inflicting little bits of damage to yourself every day for the course of years, and it all stacks up in the end. What made you decide to stop and get, actually get help? Yeah, so there were really two two pieces. I, I really appreciate what you just said, because that has been my experience. And it's also something that kept me from seeking help for a really, really long time. Like when I saw messages that said, do you have a gambling problem? And there are people that just seem like destitute. And I, I envisioned someone with a gambling problem as like the guy I would see at the horse track with his last $5, right? Clearly like in trouble. And so I justified it for a really, really long time in my life. Well, like I'm not going into debt, so I don't have a gambling problem, right? I'm only gambling with what I can afford to lose. And this is what I can afford to lose. Just everything. It was really hard for me to understand what was happening to myself, which sounds funny to say, but really part of it was denial. And part of it was, I just, I didn't know what to look for. So the first time that I really got to the point where I felt like I needed help was in my late 20s as I was turning, you know, getting ready to turn 30 and having a bit of a, not midlife crisis, but you know, a kind of uh, introspection of like, oh man, I'm an adult now. Like, what am I doing? I just started to look around and I saw my friends that had relationships and were starting to get engaged and get married and buy houses and, and do these things. And I, I didn't have any of that, right? I, I just looked at my friends and I said, man, like, I am so behind and maybe the gambling and all the money that I'm spending and the time that I'm spending is keeping me from these more worthwhile things. And the second was by that point, I recognized that I didn't have control over my gambling. And I would go through these periods where I would say, okay, I'm not going to gamble for two weeks. And I wouldn't, but it would be miserable, right? I would like try to exhaust myself in the gym or at work. And I would just be sitting there like, I call it white knuckling it, right? Just like waiting for the other shoe to drop. And then inevitably, whether it was three days or two weeks or whatever, I would slip and I would immediately go back to like super heavy gambling. And after I did this, I don't know, 25 times, I just said, okay, I, I need some help. And after a particularly bad session where I'm sure I lost a couple thousand dollars. I looked up a therapist online that said that they specialized in behavioral addictions. And I, I took myself to, to therapy. That experience for me was really, really interesting. Um, you know, I walked into this therapist's office and basically the way that I saw it was I, I have this like head wound, right? Like I walked into the hospital and I'm like bleeding from my head. And I said, man, like I, I need some help. I can't stop gambling. I have this bad habit. And they started trying to dive into my childhood, right? And my trauma that I must have experienced in the past and these things. And I just really felt like that didn't connect with my personal experience. I have two super supportive parents. You know, I was raised middle class in the Bay Area with, you know, great schooling and I went to college and I had a good career. I just felt like I had so much privilege coming in the door that I, I didn't deserve to have a gambling problem like other people that, you know, had real problems. I made myself go to therapy once a week for probably three months, maybe a little bit more. And at first I was able to string together maybe two or three weeks of clean time from gambling, but eventually I, I slipped and it got to the point where I would just walk into the therapist's office, lie to them or tell them the truth, depending on the day, and then walk out and gamble on my phone as I was leaving the therapist's office. And for me, I just felt at, at some point, like, what am I doing? You know, that this is silly. I had almost the exact same experience when it came to therapy. It was like, we were trying to figure out the root causes of the traumas that must have existed in my past. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, who cares what happened in seventh grade if your friend ditched you or whatever, and that's why you're gambling. If you're still leaving here and you're going and placing sports bets, right? It was like, the house was on fire. And instead of putting out the fire, we were trying to rebuild the foundation. It didn't quite work for me either. So I can relate to that experience. But I think that what the, the problem was for me, and you can tell me if it was for you, they knew a lot about mental health, but not a lot about gambling. And so the way that we were going about things, it was like really helpful for someone that 
had the time and mental space to actually heal and work on themselves. Do you feel like that was the same with you? A hundred percent. And I think that, you know, at that point, gambling really got lumped into just the general umbrella of addiction, right? But it, it is, it's it's really unique. I, I tell people that all the time. It, it's a very different beast. So that that was my first attempt. They also recommended that I go to Gamblers Anonymous, which I was not open to doing at first. One of the big things for me was that this was a secret. People knew that I gambled somewhat, right? But it, it was not, nobody knew that I had a problem. Nobody knew that I was struggling or that, you know, any of this. And going to Gamblers Anonymous, especially living in my hometown, felt like, you know, I was <laughs> giving myself up. But I did eventually when I was in a different city for a work trip. And I, I also did not have a great experience with my first GA meeting. You know, I, I walked in, it was in a basement of a church, kind of exactly the stereotypical picture that I had in my head of what it was going to be like. And, you know, I said, my name is Sam. I'm a, you know, I have a gambling problem or bad gambling habit. It was powerful to share my story with other people that weren't just, you know, the therapist. But as I started listening to their stories, I was the youngest person in the room by like, 20 years at that point, right? And and I was almost 30. And they were talking about having been in recovery for 10 plus years and how they used to gamble at the sports track on the horses or, you know, at the video poker machine. And at that point, I was like using cryptocurrency to gamble on my cell phone, right? At my tech job. And I just felt like these people don't understand me or my reality or like what I'm going through, which was really naive of me. Uh, you know, it was, I think it was an immature sentiment. And I, I think that I was looking for reasons to not like it, but it really did keep me from connecting and, and having GA be part of my recovery. It's the idea of like, when you first want to stop doing something, if there's friction there, it gives you that extra space to think, do I actually want to follow through with this? And I think the feedback about GA is something that I hear a lot, especially from younger people who try or who use newer forms of gambling, we'll call them, the crypto casinos, like social sports books, things that just didn't exist. And when you walk in there and the guy said, you know, my first bet was when they opened the doors in the Atlantic City casinos and I had to wear a suit jacket. It definitely gives that friction to someone that's looking for a reason not to be there. So you're not alone in that either. Is that kind of why you've created Evive and the technology that you have now to kind of bridge that gap in understanding? Yeah, um, I really love what what you said earlier, like at the top of this call, you know, try to help the person that you used to be. For me, when I really looked at my own experience, there were essentially three distinct periods. The first, when I was initially playing poker, where I really felt like I got a lot of value out of the activity of playing poker. I met new people. I, you know, it forced me to kind of think strategically. I, I thought it was, you know, by and large, pretty positive in my life. But myself, nor like my parents or anybody knew what gambling harm was, right? Like I got a poker table for my 15th birthday. And I thought that was awesome. And my parents thought it was awesome because we were at home and not on the street drinking or smoking or whatever. For that period of time, I wish that I knew, right? Like when you go to have your first drink, I think it's pretty common in society, right? You don't drive, right? I I don't think that that exists for gambling by and large. And I really wish that I had known what to look out for or some of the risks that, you know, I might experience with, you know, a history of addiction in my family and, and things like that. I think that I would have made more cautious and better choices in the beginning. And then the second period of time for me was really when I started to experience harm from gambling, but I definitely did not consider myself someone who was addicted, right? Like the first time that I went to the ATM machine and told myself I was only going to take out 100 and took out 500 and then took a cash advance on my credit card. The first time that I told myself I was going to go to the poker table and didn't get there because I got sidetracked by the slot machines. I wish that at that point I had a way to dig into the experience that I was having and really understand what was going on with me. 
because I didn't see gambling as the problem. I saw the problem was that I was bored and I had to wait five hours in the casino. I saw the problem that, you know, I drank too much and I went to the casino late at night and of course I'm not going to make good decisions. Or I got in a fight with my girlfriend and I needed something to take the edge off of, right? I didn't have the self-awareness. And then really the, the third stage for me is now, right? Where I'm in recovery from gambling and I, I see it as a chronic condition. I see it as something that I have to actively manage every day. And one of the things that I really didn't like about Gamblers Anonymous was this admitting that I'm powerless over gambling. I wasn't ready to do that because I felt like that meant I was giving up and I had to live this life of just being defeated and feeling like there's this thing that I love and I'm not going to allow myself to do it. And I didn't want to live my life that way. That, like, how do I maintain my gambling-free life, which is the foundation of my entire life today? I needed a tool to be able to do that. So I really built Evive trying to think, how do we give the right tools to the right people at the right time and make it really accessible and discreet? Because I didn't want anybody to know in the beginning about the challenges that I was dealing with. Even coming on, you know, a podcast like this with you, who I've known now for a year, right? Like, it's it's tough to talk about, right? I, I still feel that. I really want to fight against the stigma and the shame around gambling addiction. But I it's something that I still struggle with, you know, even today. If I gave you 30 seconds to explain to the audience what is Evive and why should they download it, what would you say? Evive is a digital health tool to help you redefine your relationship with gambling. If you want to stop gambling and maintain a gamble-free life, Evive gives you all of the tools and the resources to be able to do that really effectively. If you are just someone who says, I don't like the way that gambling is showing up in my life right now. I'm spending too much money. I'm spending too much time. My partner doesn't like it. Download Evive. Evive is a great way to evaluate your own relationship with gambling, learn something new, and really make better decisions going forward. Eventually, what broke it for me was my fiance at the time. I had proposed. She had said yes. And then maybe like a month or two after our engagement, she sat down with me and she said, hey, I don't know what's going on with you. I don't know if you have a drug problem. I don't know if you're cheating on me, but something is up, right? 90% of the time, you're this guy that I love and I want to marry. And 10% of the time, you're this totally different, irritable, short-tempered, secretive person. And you need to tell me what's happening or I can't in good conscience, you know, marry you. And that was it for me. You know, people talk about kind of rock bottom. Like that was it. I made a very clear and rational decision in my head that I was either going to tell her and I was going to finally quit gambling like forever. Or if I couldn't do that and if I chose gambling over her and this life that I wanted, um, that I, I was going to kill myself because I just felt like that that was my only option. Um, and so I did, I, I told her. And, you know, at that point, she didn't know anything about gambling, really, gambling addiction, but she's really smart, you know? And she really helped me start to learn. And what really clicked for me, like, I don't remember the last day that I gambled. I don't remember the last bet that I placed, but with the help of my fiance, I gave away financial control to her and she took over my finances and it stopped my access to money largely. I started reading a lot of books, a lot of books about the kind of neuroscience of addiction, about what gambling does to your dopamine levels in your brain. I read Addiction by Design by Natasha Dow Scholl and The Easy Way to Stop Gambling by Alan Carr. And these books really reframed for me what was happening in my head and helped me break free from the tug of war of like, the rational side of me knows that this is a problem 
and the you know compulsive side of me wants to do it anyway that just kept me feeling at war with myself for so many years to this is a neurological condition and something that is happening in my brain and i can view my desire to gamble not as an authentic voice from me but as this kind of insidious you know remnant of this disease that i have and then i can fight against it and so from the time that my fiance gave me that ultimatum to now like i definitely have gambled and slipped you know in the last 4 or 5 years but what used to happen is that i would string two weeks together and then i would buy like a one dollar lotto ticket and i would say oh my god my sobriety is done i just ruined it and it doesn't start again until tomorrow i would relapse and go well it's a free day and i would end up at the card table or making a deposit on a sports book and from that point when i would gamble i would see what i was doing and be like oh man i'm gambling because i'm really stressed out at work and I'm going to stop this and do something different. Or I'm gambling because I'm really tired and I know that I'm really tired. And it was like the big earthquake was done and there were these little aftershocks. And now in my life, the time between those aftershocks is just getting longer and longer and longer. And it's getting easier and easier for me to not gamble. I heard this quote once and it said basically that addictions grow in darkness and in silence. You're taking that step to have that conversation with your then fiance, now wife, was basically ripping the Band-Aid off and finally saying, hey, like this is a real problem. And then you were able to take practical steps. And that's the beautiful thing. It's like that first step was probably the hardest thing out of all of it, I'd imagine. Is that correct? A hundred percent. And this is really what eVive is designed for, right? Like I really tried to build this technology to make it as easy as possible for someone to figure out what's going on and then make that first step whether that first step is man i really need some professional help and to talk to somebody or that first step is man i really need to recognize this is becoming a problem the way that i'm gambling and i need to change how i'm doing it it's that fundamental self-awareness that is at the heart of what we're really trying to build. I know, as you said, it's not easy to talk about gambling problems and talk about the harm that are brought into your life, but I'm happy that you're still here on this planet, that we're having this conversation, and that you're doing the work that you do over at Evi. Thank you so much for the time and to the audience. Let's just keep getting better together one day at a time.